Hello, everyone. I think we're ready to begin. I want to welcome everybody to this concluding session of our seminar on the power and allure of dictators. I think we still have a few people coming into the room, but we have our, our team of panelists with us. I'm Lloyd Kramer, the Director of Carolina Public Humanities, a professor in the History Department, and it's my pleasure to serve as moderator at this final session of a seminar that began on Monday and has been filled with rich presentations. I simply re remind everyone that our speakers included Richard Talbert, who is the William Rand Keenan Jr. Jr. Professor of History Emeritus, expert on ancient Rome. Uh, the, uh, my colleague, Max Orr, who is the Executive Director of Carolina Public Humanities and a Teaching Assistant Professor of History, who spoke to us about Napoleon. Anna Krolova, who is our colleague and friend over at Duke and who spoke to us about Stalin, ideology and terror, and my colleague uh, Miguel Lacerna in the history department at UNC, professor of history, who spoke about por la patria, nationalism and autocracy in Latin America. Let me explain that we will be meeting for about an hour. This is a typical panel discussion as we usually have at the end of our sessions. And uh, what we want to do is invite you to submit questions through the Q&A function at the bottom of your Zoom screen. I will then field the questions and pass them on to the panelists. And I want to again thank our, our supporters, including the um, Carolina Meadows and the Cotton Merca Group at uh, Morgan Stanley and all of our friends and supporters who helped to make this possible. So to launch the discussion, I simply want to raise a question that I'd like each of the panelists to respond to, and then I'll turn to other questions. And you are certainly welcome to take this question in any way you want. But there is a sort of stereotype about dictators as people who seize power militarily with a small group of armed supporters or hold power through very uh, restricted military um, support. And yet each of you, as you spoke about powerful leaders, stressed that they always had lots of support when they came to power, that in fact they were able to build support in many cases by claiming that they were defending some part of their cultural history or political history. And you've also stressed that they always described enemies, dangers that had to be defeated. And so the allure and power of dictators is also a story of mass popular support, contrary to what we might imagine as small groups of leaders. And in this respect, it often seems that the nature of power in a dictatorship is not altogether different from the allure of power in a democracy. That is the claim to defend against danger, to represent history, and to embody the will of the people. So I would like for you each to begin by just saying, to what extent do you think this explanation that I just described explains the power and allure of dictators in Rome, in Napoleonic France, in Stalinist Russia, and in the countries of Latin America that Miguel talked about? And I suppose we should start chronologically, because doesn't it always begin in antiquity? Richard, you need to unmute yourself to join the conversation. Is that better? There you are. Welcome. Welcome oh, to everybody. Hi. Yeah, sorry. It's so good to see you. You're all such good, yeah, interesting I'm sorry people. there couldn't be any Roman music. and We had very stern <laughs> music, but, uh, Roman music's a bit in short supply. Um, but um, no, I think everything you've just, not everything, but a lot of what you've just enunciated or laid down in general terms, Lloyd, doesn't apply to Rome. Hey, the last thing that Sulla had was mass support. Uh, he thought that the masses were just a blooming nuisance and uh, the more they could be pushed aside and not cared about, the better, so far as he was concerned. And uh, yeah, uh, I wouldn't say Caesar necessarily had support. It was more a matter of indifference that, and the one thing Caesar wasn't was a threat. And he wasn't going to rush around killing everybody the way that Sulla was or did. 
Uh, and to that extent, people accepted him. I'm not sure they were really that keen on him. And Augustus, Octavian, Augustus, uh, again, I think he's just the best of a miserable lot of power law, you know, warlords who are, are, are feuding with each other. Um, so I don't know whether, um, I'm not sure that general formulation will work so well for Rome. But then, of course, Rome doesn't really develop this idea or the sovereign dictator. Rome very much wants to go the other way and wants to have, when it's appropriate, wants to have commissary dictators who only fulfill very limited functions. But I had a general question for you and for everybody else. And this is, this is just an observation, and I wondered about this. It did strike me that um, quite a lot of the rulers, the leaders that we were talking about uh, in the Americas, uh, uh, Russia, Napoleon, sure, they were very autocratic, but were they dictators? Did they call themselves dictators? It seemed to me that we moved away from any strict uh, uh, attention to dictatorship to autocracy. Mm -hmm. I don't know whether that matters, but that's, that's a question. That's also, an interesting... I just don't know uh, how many of these leaders actually called themselves dictators. Some, sure, yeah. I realize they do. But did they all, is this irrelevant? Yeah. So just on Caesar Augustus, he did claim to restore certain aspects of Rome at the beginning. Yeah. And this is a pattern that many of these people have claimed. I'm defending. Oh, yeah. I'm going to make Rome great again. Oh, yeah. Of, uh, oh, yeah. With that tradition. So yeah. let me move to Napoleon. I mean, Max. I, <laughs> any thoughts about the general question? Are you frozen? I believe Max is now frozen. This is uh, this is history in the age of Zoom. We'll come back to Max. He's he's lost in thought. Anna, do you think that Stalin was able to gain power because he could claim that he was representing the general will of the people? Well, um, of course, uh, Stalin. That was the, I mean, the major claim of Stalin and the Communist Party was that actually this institution represents uh, the interest of the, of the people. First, but the people would be hierarchized from within. First, the party will be representing the interest of the working class and anyone, and presuming okay, within the ideological discourse that everyone else will be somehow part and parcel of this, of this, of the proletarian worldview, which actually ultimately had a very positive uh, message of uh, not just a just society, but wealthy society, society that actually operates as a democracy for all. In fact, trying to achieve a high stage of democracy where democracy means not treating everyone as equal, but actually treating everyone as different, recognizing difference and through the difference actually allowing society to operate uh, as, a, 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 as a true a high stage of democracy. So, uh, for Stalin, uh, also the most important claim would be to, uh, industri to, to make Russia actually a modern society, to take it out of the mm -hmm. agrarian kind of uh, centuries of agrarian history and push it into the modernity and also point out, uh, to point out kind of the strengths of the party and the socialist economy uh, that actually can allow Russia to make this major step. Uh, but I was also thinking, uh, I, I, your question made me think about two things. Uh, first thing is that either autocrats or dictators, but autocrats definitely, uh, tend to be remarkable strategists. People who actually can play chess, uh, like m very complex chess. <laughs> uh, many, many moves that actually are kind of and like planned and anticipated and then carried out over a very long period of time. Yes. Uh, and incredible flexibility at the same time. So with Stalin, we can actually see that very well. Uh, what, that this person actually 
could take defeats, who could actually calculate his steps, who could also move, I mean, who could take advantage of not just weaknesses of his friends, comrades, and uh, colleagues, but also kind of provoke them to act in a certain way to take advantage of them. So, so the strat kind of, uh, the autocrats tend to be strategists, they're a good strategist, and also really have some kind of instant insight into people's psychology and mm -hmm. people's weaknesses. So this is just in a very kind of personal way. This was one thing that I thought about. And another thought was is that modern dictators tend to come uh, or become dictators or autocrats by actually using democratic, uh, uh, democratic systems. Mm -hmm. So even in the case of the Soviet Union, Stalin actually became acquired the kind of the amount of power that he did acquire through democratic procedures of the Communist Party. Yeah. Even though the Soviet Union was one party system, the Communist Party actually operated as a democratic as a democratic party. Uh, elections, um, majorities mattered, <laughs> minorities minorities lost. So it is precisely by taking advantage advantage of the democratic system. It's actually the same, the same thing is very, like basically the same thing is happening in, in uh, with Putin, but Putin is just taking the art of taking advantage of democracy to a new level of farce. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Where like everything is completely staged. With Stalin it was not staged. He indeed was actually appealing and mobilizing a new kind of audiences that the revolution was bringing into the political uh, forefront. Mm -hmm. So, so this is a combination of, of, of kind of, of remarkable ability to strategize within, first within the democratic institutions, and only then those democratic institutions become secondary, and mm -hmm. they become un, basically mm -hmm. kind of as an attachment to the autocratic personality that is running the show. So that's what I was thinking about. Yeah, and, and also the democratic element, if one could use that in quotation mark, is that many of these people come from very humble backgrounds, unlike traditional leaders who would come from social elites, as in Rome, for example, from the elite families. Yeah. Max, you're back with us now. Yes. We lost you. You were just frozen in time. Well, I, it would be a rare occasion where you ask me a question. I just have nothing to say. <laughs> Complete silence. This is not in my personality. What are your thoughts so, uh, before you freeze again? Well, I, 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 a couple things. I'll be quick about this. I just, to the point about, you know, the autocrats or dictators that uh, Richard had pointed out. I mean, I think that's absolutely from the Roman example. I mean, we see in Rome this idea that we don't want to repeat Sulla and we did and Augustus didn't want to use that word anymore. And I think that that is a, a cultural accretion on that word itself. It's an accusation labeled against people. And in many ways, we have to understand that. And in a way, when I was talking about the Middle Ages, there are plenty of people who acted like autocrats, but for whatever, excuse me, like dictators, but we didn't call them such. But as we begin to get the Republican forms back again, as we begin to get some sense of uh, legality in offices and whatnot, then the word dictator comes up again as an accusation for those that flout the democratic systems like uh, Dr. Karlova was just talking about, that you know you can use democracy, but if you go too, one step too far, you become a dictator. So I think the word itself is a connotation and a denotation. The denotation is pretty specific in the Roman mm -hmm. context, but it has all sorts of you know uh, vague connotations, but they all seem to be pretty negative and describing yep. what we just basically would call autocratic behavior. Very quickly on the power and allure question, I was really inspired um, by uh, by Anna Miguel's talks about two things. One, of course, is the scapegoating that is necessary, and I don't think that I uh, asserted enough. Um, how much external war is just a perfect foil for any dictator. If you have an external crisis at all times, uh, it's much easier. Now, of course, Napoleon early on had to scapegoat internal enemies, and we saw how he had done that. Um, but by the time of, you know, he, when I say he's sort of just all full-on dictator after his um, uh, uh, crowning of the empire, um, I think that the external scapegoating is just a, obviously a perfect foil for any uh, buddy who has to marshal mm -hmm. support. You get the allure through the scapegoating, protecting France. Um, and one final thing that I think is really important too, and, and this was mentioned uh, in, and hinted at, Miguel definitely made it a central part of his talk about the insertion of oneself into history. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that Napoleon is inserting himself not only in a sort of a long history of France, you know, hearkening back to Charlemagne and doing this sort of heroic things, but he also had very short-term history that he inserted himself in with this notion of ending the revolution and unifying two historical parts of France that had been left, and I'm gonna bring these together and unify these. And of course, if you can insert yourself into that history, a very history that everybody remembers, 
and somehow pull off this idea through the combination of foreign scapegoating. That I think let a lot of people uh, let Napoleon maintain his allure for for you know a long time. And certainly, if you're victorious and your armies are able to you know bring glory to France, and before you start sending people off to the charnel house of Spain every year, or you know eventually getting 16 year old soldiers because you've wiped out your whole conscription class, I think you can definitely maintain the allure. One final thing on that point is the burden of these wars were uh, largely on the lower classes, of course. And so for there are plenty of people who um, like Napoleon because of, uh, you can live a pretty stable life in internal France and do quite well with some of the advancements Napoleon had if you're not being pulled off into these armies. Mm -hmm. And certainly you're buying people off with favors, like I mentioned as well. So I think there's a, a popular reason for his uh, allure. There's a a sort of contingent one with the war situation. And then there's, of course, the cynical reason for his allure. And that is, you know, if you don't have to suffer the consequences of this dictatorship, if you're not a particularly politically active person, you don't really care, you want to live your life. Napoleon has created a, you know, a civil society, at least until France gets uh, really um, economically hurt by the blockade. But for a while there, you can maintain a pretty good life under Napoleon, even in these, in these wars. Yeah. So I think that that's one way to think about history and the scapegoating and whatnot mm -hmm. to explain. Thank, it. thank you. Yeah, I think it shows that even dictators need historical narratives, right? And mm -hmm. that's very important. Which brings me to Miguel, who also talked about historical narratives. What about the issue of popularity and history and scapegoating? Yeah, I think it's a really great question to get us started off. So I appreciate you asking that, uh, Lloyd, and I appreciate the answers and different perspectives from uh, different moments in history and different parts of the world that uh, my colleagues have given so far. Uh, to that, I would just add that the um, that I do think that you do not need the you know the majority of the population to, to support you if you're a dictatorship, but you do need what I would say is probably, or at least in the Latin American examples that I gave, you need probably a substantial minority. Mm -hmm. and a silent majority. Yeah. Uh, and, and I think that's really, really key. It, it, the, most people probably in places like, like uh, Peru, in, um, in uh, the Southern Cone, in Chile, Argentina, and Cuba even, they, if, they, if they were not supportive and even if they were critical of the government, that they, they needed to keep that to themselves, uh, really, so that they would not uh, risk any kind of retribution from, from mm -hmm. the state. And so I think one of the things that, that helps these uh, dictators, if we want to call them that, I think it's a really good question, Richard, about whether or not, especially in the Latin American case, if they are dictators, but um, to keep these autocrats sort of um, in power, they need that silent majority to stay silent. And I think when you see people starting to speak out and the, another kind of uh, substantial uh, minority, which is the opposition, uh, people who resist that um, that autocracy, when, when you see um, them starting to get through to the silent majority and let them know that it's okay to, to resist, it's okay to question, uh, and it's okay to challenge the rule of the, of the autocrat. I think that's when you start to see the, um, the rulership being uh, really put in jeopardy. And I think that's what happened, for example, in Chile, when you started to see a competing memory narrative emerge mm -hmm. that was a human rights narrative. And it was one about this dictatorship is actually um, is, is, is a real attack on our human rights and on our, our, our actual civil liberties. And so when that, so this is a threat, the bigger threat is actually that of the autocrat to our own safety. And when that kind of is able to take hold, you start to see some people in the silent majority start to go with that. So there's a plebiscite in, uh, in uh, Chile, uh, which of course led to uh, Pinochet, um, his continued role being, uh, being uh, rejected. Uh, and, and in Peru, you saw Fujimori go for, uh, run for an unconstitutional third uh, term uh, in the year 2000. But again, some of the, um, the past crimes that, he, that his uh, regime had committed started to really get out into the public sphere and they started and they made it okay for people to really uh, get to, you know, object to that. And again, add that competing uh, memory framework. So I do think you're right, Lloyd, that, that memory uh, battles and the insertion into history is important, but you see a strong civil society that is able to kind of risk that, um, you know, what the repercussions could be of, 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 of protesting. If they can latch on to enough of the silent majority to create a, another majority of resistance, then that's mm -hmm. when you see them start to crumble. 
Yeah, and each side then can claim we're the true representatives of the historical tradition here. And that's right. And that shifts the discourse, the debate. Yeah, because because it seems like we were talking about the allure of democracy. One of the allures of democracy, particularly in, in the 20th century Latin American context, has been precisely of uh, being uh, uh, overthrowing dictators. Yeah. <laughs> right? so, so that's the tradition. That, so that's <laughs> yeah. kind of like the real threat that then becomes uh, really worth overthrowing is that of these dictators. And so I think it's a terrific question. Okay, well, we've been getting some questions in, and I'm going to just read some questions that are coming. This first one is from Rich Haney, and it also asks for some historical perspective, but then connects us to the present, and I, I'll be interested in your thoughts on this. It says, we have been making progress on democracy slowly but surely since the time of Athens in 300 BCE. If Mr. Trump wins in November, what is the danger of our turning away from this form toward authoritarianism permanently? No danger whatsoever, a small danger, a moderate danger, or a great danger? That's like a multiple choice question there. Um, based, let's think of this in historical context. I guess the question is, what seems similar or different in our own situation to the stories you've all told? Who wants to begin with that? It's a hot potato, but it's very relevant. This is actually part of the debate we're having right now in American society. Uh, I'm not going to weigh in. I'm going to just do a quick thing and just say I was very inspired by what I just heard from Miguel about civil society. And so if I'm just going to make a vote, I'm going to say we are in a short term severe crisis, but we have the resources and that we have a very well developed civil society to figure out how to get ourselves back into a place where we can accept the notion of a legitimate opposition um, from both sides, perhaps. Um, but right now it's a severe crisis. That would be my answer to well, that's the interesting. first part okay. of it. Okay. Any other thoughts? Anna, you wanna unmute? Um, I'm, if Trump wins uh, this November, I actually would be very, very uh, scared. Uh, because what I actually see, I I, I'm, I'm, uh, I see the potential that this uh, the state, what what actually say it this way, is when I look at the way, for example, Stalin accumulated his power, and I why do why I do believe that he was a dictator is because that once he actually achieved his position, he started using the state as a terroristic uh, tool. So when uh, civil society actually confronts the state with all its might. Uh, it becomes very difficult to resist. Mm -hmm. And I think actually the case of modern Russia is the basically case in point. Uh, Russian society has a very strong opposition, even though we don't read a lot about it in contemporary press. We only read when such major events like a poisoning, poisoning of a major opposition leader actually takes place. Uh, but it has become exceptionally difficult to protest and to behave like civil society in Russia at the present moment, precisely because society, civil society is confronted with terroristic state that just crushes people's lives and people's uh, relatives' lives. So the opposition under such conditions becomes impossible and from outside it looks like the society is not really responding. And I see, uh, I can actually, I mean, so I already see how the current administration is already using the state and the institutions of the state and even the letter of the law in manipulating in such a way that actually it becomes very difficult to counteract those very powerful moves with civil rights protest. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, yeah. in, so the prospects, we are in the much, I think that the crisis a lot <laughs> is, is this, I have never seen such a crisis before. Uh, I don't know how to handle this crisis. Uh, I think uh, it has to be done not only through civil protest, but also through institutions and is organizing within institutions. So that's, um, so, so we, I think that of course we all should vote, but we also need to think <laughs> out what exactly we're going to do what, if this doesn't work out the way we believe it should and would have had it been actually just election, for example. Um, Richard, drawing on the demise of the Roman Republic as an example, um, what are the parallels or differences between the sort of situation that people are worried about today and what happened at the time of Julius Caesar? Any thoughts? 
Yeah, I, yeah, again, I don't want to be the wet blanket, but I would say they aren't because by that stage, Rome is no longer a, citiz a state of functioning citizens. Mm -hmm. It's become too big. Its institutions have not been reformed. It's become too big and ordinary citizens simply don't have a voice anymore. Mm -hmm. What I think we can say is that, and this, this I think follows up and, and reinforces what, what Anna was, the, the point she was making. What we can say is that at a higher level, Augustus uh, plays a very smart hand when on uh, one side, he says to the senators, you matter, I care about you. I want the Senate to function freely as it once did, and, and I'm one of you. I'm not setting it aside or squashing it or demeaning it the way that Julius Caesar did. Uh, uh, I, I want you to flourish mm -hmm. uh, and, and to rule, but at the same time, he has all the cards in his hand. Uh, and uh, he is able, if you like, uh, to dupe them, to flatter them. And mm -hmm. they accept this. And also, of course, they've learned that if they hope that authority really will come back to them, uh, one thing they can't do, because it's been proven it doesn't work, is kill the hated dictator, mm -hmm. because when, when they killed Caesar, hoping that they would get their authority back, all that led to was a fight among warlords. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, so uh, um, it's, it's a very clever ploy. Um, whether this makes Augustus like Stalin, I'm not quite sure, but uh, certainly there is no mass citizen role here. Yeah. And the institutions, what you're saying is the institutions that had functioned had become dysfunctional yep. by that point. Yep. And I think that's what Anna's pointing out as a risk as well. Miguel, do you have any thoughts in response to this question about, um, is this a, a permanent threat, a current threat? Not a threat at all. Yeah, I mean, I think certainly as a 20th century Latin American historian, um, I, I had to share the gloomier outlook that Anna has, has already shared, uh, just in terms of the parallels. I think um, in, in many countries in Latin America with an experience dictatorships or, or military uh, regimes uh, in the 20th century, the, many of them had a long legacy of democracy beforehand. And, and it was one of those things where people never also thought it would never be possible in their countries to have a Pinochet type regime in Chile. It they, they, they was not really fathomable, uh, but it kind of happened. And, and then once it was done, it, it was done. And, and, uh, and I feel like um, the best kind of response for, for us is, is to be vigilant. As Anna said, it's, it's not just about voting, but it's about being vigilant in terms of ensuring that our democratic principles and institutions uh, remain intact. And, and they, we've seen that they won't remain intact on their own just mm -hmm. because of momentum. And there is no such thing as American exceptionalism. We uh, could be, uh, we are just as, as susceptible to this type of uh, power grab as any other place on earth. Mm -hmm. And so this is our moment, I think, uh, to, to really step up, be vigilant, uh, and, uh, and um, absolutely not allow for, um, for anything less than a total liberal democracy like we have. Thank you. Thank you, and, and I appreciate the question. Uh, we'll, we'll move on now to another question. This one is from Jonathan Gerard. He, he refers to a term he said he learned in school in anthropology called oriental despotism. Um, is this just another term for dictator? Is it a subcategory of authoritarian? Uh, does anyone use this term? I think it's an outdated term. No one would use this mm -hmm. term now. Um, I learned that oriental despotism is a system in which a tyrant uses his power to create great building projects like pyramids. Is there any, any value whatsoever in using such categories, despotism, 
this seems to place it in the east rather than the west. Maybe that makes it safer well, to people in the west. Max? I just would have an interesting, I want to uh, ask uh, Richard to, to give us a little bit more background information on sort of the historical notion of the east versus the west, in, even in Rome. But it is certainly a case that Napoleon was caught between, I mentioned all these various political ideas that sort of informed his thinking. And so he's caught between sort of this Roman precedent of being a great man in the Roman tradition, but also equally fascinated by the idea of Alexander the Great, who seemed to have adopted many of the trappings of Oriental despotism as we know it. And so um, I would say within Napoleon's own personality, he's functioning according to what I call the first nationalist dictator, using these democratic forms and you know, mm -hmm. propping himself as the voice of the people. But in the back of his head, he also has this romantic vision that is very much thinking of this Oriental. I mean, his time in Egypt, he was he was ready to just stop being a Frenchman. You know, he he had toyed with the idea of becoming a Muslim so that he could lead the, as he called them, the hordes of the East. You know, so I do think it is an absolutely a different category of ruler. And Napoleon uh, was certainly influenced by the historical trajectory of of each of them. So, Ooh, well, sorry. Oh, yes. Um, go ahead. And then Anna also, I want to get, because this is a term sometimes used for Russia. But go ahead, Richard. Yeah, How, I don't think, well, Max, you asked me. Yeah, I, I don't think I would, yeah, I, I wouldn't want to use Oriental despotism. I think that the despotism is really the same as the autocracy, the dictatorship. It's this mm -hmm. kind of thing. It's absolute rule that, we're, that we've been talking about. It's just another label. The Oriental, well, certainly, uh, so far as somebody like, uh, probably Napoleon too, somebody like Augustus would have been concerned, or a Roman emperor, was the Persian king of kings the Parthian or, or uh, Persian king of kings. And uh, suddenly, uh, <laughs> I don't like to remind people of this perhaps, but um, the, uh, at the end of the third century uh, CE, uh, Diocletian and his tetrarchs uh, had a, uh, a big clash with Persia um, and they won. Uh, they were exposed quite a lot to uh, uh, Persian rule and how it operated, and they were impressed. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's, we should remember that it's Diocletian who changes the nature of Augustus's informal principate to a much more showy, in-your-face autocracy. Mm -hmm. It's yeah. Diocletian who uh, has a throne room, uh, people have to prostrate themselves in front of him, just as Persians had to do. Uh, the emperor wears fine clothes, he has a crown. All these are things that, uh, that they're very reminiscent, of course, of what Julius Caesar would have liked. And uh, Augustus was very against all that. But it's the Persian model that mm -hmm. uh, Diocletian then takes over. And all these trappings, uh, think of the, the pictures you showed us of Napoleon's coronation ceremony and so on. Uh, uh, bringing that to the West actually is the step taken by Diocletian, around about 300. Okay, any thoughts about this, Anna? Um, sometimes people talk about Stalin as something from the East, but... Uh, what do you think of this uh, old cliche? Um, I think it's a very nostalgic cliche. I think <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's, it's a, it points to the times when Western intellectuals could actually point to the East as being somehow exceptional, uh, having an exceptional historical trajectory and claim uh, exceptionalism uh, from a despotism uh, and uh, uh, threats to democracy. So that was happy time. We are not living in this time at all. And, I mean, not, not over the last four years, that's especially so, but in general, that actually. So this kind of, th this, this is a term that presupposes that we could actually draw some kind of very clear line between Western and Eastern or uh, Oriental uh, political histories and political trajectories. And um, 
the contemporary uh, time actually sort of kind of points how point I'm looking at just we're not using it because there is no historical uh, basis for that category any longer but at this particular moment we can actually see that we are we are now becoming the east or the or like oriental despotism is just what we actually have uh, coming uh, because I actually wanted to mention that I, I can uh, I can actually see a lot of parallels the way the current administration is using the state and the way for example the Putin administration is using the state like it, it took uh, the current administration some time to realize that actually the state doesn't doesn't need to report all the deaths doesn't need to report the correct information can just create omissions in historical record can misrepresent uh, I mean some different Societies do it. I don't know. Some administrations do it better than others. Can claim, uh, then can then create imaginary enemies that are everywhere and and that are trying to steal things. Like this is just exactly the language that Russian political uh, uh, elite uh, has been speaking for the last fifteen years. Mm -hmm. So so I'm impressed. Like I I I I'm, I'm, I was kind of uh, okay. So I was like, is uh, our current administration just just learning from <laughs> Putin? <laughs> Or this is something inherent to the position that the current administration find itself in and needs, and this is the actual terms and categories that start making sense to them. Yeah, so the dichotomy East-West is not such a relevant category of analysis, um, and as it wasn't for Diocletian either, I suppose. Mm -hmm. Miguel, do you have any thoughts about this? Um, the notion well, I, think, I think my colleagues really, uh, really hit it uh, the best. I don't know if I can add too much, but did, I did think about this this point about the building, like the building of the pyramids as part of the question. And and that is, there might be something to that because I figure when I think of the the uh, kind of more authoritarian figures uh, in, in, in Latin American history or in modern history, they do have building as yeah. part of their 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 way of, co of consolidating their symbolic power. So I think there's something there, whether it's building the border wall, what that Mexico is going to pay for, <laughs> Or, um, or Fujimori famously uh, built roads to try to kind of build up the infrastructure, schools and roads in, in Peru. Castro obviously is a different uh, scenario because of the embargo and he didn't really have the ability to do as much infrastructure. But, but I do think that, that there might be something to that um, and, 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 and that kind of seals that, that sort of, that, that pact between society and, and the ruler that is, that is worth mentioning. Yeah, Napoleon built a lot too. Sure. So yeah, it's win-win because because the building of very of very vis large visible monuments or infrastructure that glorifies the regime and it also provides lots of employment. Yeah, and certainly every powerful leader wants to leave some monument of that kind. So this is a question I think coming from Abby, maybe Abby Allen, our friend in uh, Stanfield. I'm wondering about the difference between a seizure of power that it occurs in the midst of political, economic, social upheaval, Caesar, Napoleon, Stalin, and the military coups in Latin America. In other words, can we draw parallels or is there something different about a military coup in Latin America? Miguel, do you want to start with that one? Does uh, it resemble Napoleon's takeover of the French Revolution? <laughs> I, mean, I definitely think the military takeovers are, are very different. Just uh, um, one is that they're, they're coups, so they, they, they take place from, from within. Um, and so they, they're already within the kind of power structure of society. It's just uh, basically choosing who gets to have that power. So we're, you know, in, in the case of Pinochet in Chile, he was already the commander in chief of, of, the, of the military. Um, and so he had that sort of uh, that military infrastructure that helped him take the power. Whereas in an insurgency like in Cuba or Nicaragua, you're, you're talking about um, a revolutionary armed struggle that, that actually um, is coming from the outside without power. And so I do think that th there's a fundamental distinction there. But uh, I would be curious to know um, how, how the others think about this in comparison to their own studies. Any thoughts about what makes these uh, takeovers similar or different? Well, in the case of Napoleon, you know, it's a, it is a military coup. It could not happen without using the military. Um, mm -hmm. And I do think what's different, I think, is the, um, and it sort of explains why Napoleon had to have this sort of, it quickly have a legal stamp that he put on it as soon as the extra legal act happened, was because it was this combination of civilians 
uh, and, and higher end, this collusion between civilians and the military. Now, of course, the civilians were quickly uh, pushed to the side when they realized that Napoleon had no intention of just sort of stabilizing the Republic for them and then receding into the background. So I, it, I'm wondering about those types of situations. What kind of civilian collusion do you have with the military? It seems like in a lot of these societies that have had democratic practices like in Latin America, we firmly have political sides, right? And so how do the, and the political actors, the civilian political actors, uh, what is the relationship between when they use the military and when the military uses them? Yeah. I think is an interesting idea here. And, and in the case of Napoleon, they all just miscalculated terribly you know, and giants of the revolution, like Abbey CS and all these other people who are lining up to say, this is great. We're just going to get a strong man in here. We'll do a little extra legal action. And then we'll reset the revolution back on its path and reset the Republic back on its path. Mm -hmm. And uh, too often the military people just say, you know, we don't really need these other folks to run this whole thing, especially if you have someone like Napoleon. This was one of the striking things about the story Anna told in that um, he was actually waging a purge of the military, which um, had a very distinctive element to it. Um, whereas many of these leaders use the military, he, he did use the military, but I gather in a different way. Is that right? Oh, uh, he was using the secret police, that yeah. became an internal army uh, for, his, for, his, uh, like for his party, and he could afford uh, to purge the military because he would immediately promote, like Stalin would immediately promote low level uh, officers into positions of, of, um, of uh, distinction. So, the, so we, when we think about the Russian case, we, uh, we need to think, kind of re remind ourselves that we're talking about a very class, uh, kind of class oriented society. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, that is exists under the conditions of promise that people from the low backgrounds actually will be able to uh, have a very kind of impressive upward mobility. So one of the promises that Stalin fulfills for the working class and kind of and the poor peasants is that he, he does promote uh, the low classes into positions of state party and military power. So from the point of view of those people, they had had the more like the most amazing <laughs> like careers made within a lifetime of one generation and they yep. also would pass it on to their next generations to the to, and create an alternative elite and that alternative elite of course creates an like, and that alternative elite really actually doesn't have to stay autocratic it actually can start fighting for democratic uh, reforms and this is what will happen so we're doing after world war ii but i would also want to uh, kind of add to what also enables stalin to come to power, but I kind of to keep, so first take advantage of the democratic uh, uh, institutions of the Communist Party and then start to, and once that was accomplished to take advantage of the state and its institutions is uh, the, this, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the state of remarkable social dis destabilization and disorganization that the Soviet Union came through, went through in late 1920s and early 30s. Uh, the, uh, so I would characterize what, what, what uh, the process kind of this, uh, the uh, period of industrialization and collectivization as period of um, frontal attack uh, on society. Mm -hmm. But what it really consisted of, it consisted of, first of all, of peasants being deprived of their families, of their communities, of their, of their own institutions that would allow them to combat and actually organize and fight back. Mm -hmm. when, when, once they have actually been deprived of those institutions in very uh, kind of violent uh, manner, uh, ability of, of society to resist and fight back actually really drastically diminishes. Mm -hmm. And the same thing also occurs to even to the working class uh, families and middle class families when a worker, when uh, Stalin actually speaking as far as build, uh, construction sites and buildings, Stalin built cities, <laughs> literally. Yeah. Like he built yeah, whole more, city. Than, That's more, than, <laughs> more than 100 cities. Uh, like, there were, like in 1928, there will be nothing in Magnitogorsk. And by 1935, you will have a plant, like a major a, a kind of a yeah. major plant with also the uh, first appearance of the, of the of the future city uh, so that kind of it's like it's playing the record of peter the great over and over again and overperforming even the most famous autocrat <laughs> of Russia. Uh, so uh so but that but if we're talking about this scale of construction where yeah. where you had nothing and then you can go and you can travel to those places and see that there are actually buildings standing there and this building yeah. producing yeah. things um 
it means that millions of people were again torn away from where they used to live and they had to be forced into new space into new places and new spaces they had to rebuild their communities they also would be usually living under conditions in which they would not be able to organize so the ability to take advantage of democracy under conditions of also total social disorganization that right. is that actually yeah. took place in russia in the mm -hmm. third, in late 20s and 30s is a contribute that's that's the historical social context yeah for this ability for Stalin to, and then of course he also creates a population that wants to have some guidance <laughs> because yeah. everything is such a dis disarray on such a grand scale, uh, then that also creates a psychological kind of expectation and appreciation of someone being in, in charge. So it's a kind of collective anomie, as we say in uh, sociology, and therefore there are no, as Tocqueville would have said, no remaining intermediary institutions. There's just Stalin and deracinated people. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm going to move on to a question for Richard because this is very specific. Uh, the question has to do with uh, Sulla. This is from James Evans. He didn't maybe care about popular opinion, mm -hmm. but didn't later emperors pay a lot of attention by the use of circuses and bread to damp down dissent? Isn't this an implicit acknowledgement that public opinion is important? You just have to distract and amuse them. Yeah, but it's, yeah, it, it's right, it is, sure, but it's, but it's much more than that. And it's what Anna talked about with Stalin, or we've talked about already, about construction, and it's not only infrastructure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, uh, Augustus build cities. Uh, mm -hmm. Roman emperors build cities. They, they, they settle people, they give them land, they give them a fresh start. Uh, and Augustus also thinks that the military is very important. He doesn't want to become an outright military leader himself, but he wants to rely very much on the military and use it and use it successfully to expand the scope of the Roman Empire. And he's unlike Napoleon in this, uh, in that um, he does this with the army and he does it very successfully and it's not a conscript army it's a, it's an army of volunteers uh, mm -hmm. and one of the reasons he gets them and keeps them right behind him is that i don't know whether you know this but to put it in modern terms he introduces the first pension scheme uh, he says you serve for 25 years and get an honorable discharge uh, and I will then give you uh, a lump sum, which is equivalent to 13 times your final annual pay. So he can't pay it by the month uh, uh, mm -hmm. through bank, electronic bank transfers. That's not possible. <laughs> uh, so he gives it all to them in a lump. Uh, and they, if they survive, and of course not all are going to survive, but if they do, wow, are they popular people with the ladies uh, in their late 40s when they retire from the army and uh, they are well-to-do people. And, and, and so, you know, if, if a rival to organization Augustus comes along, some rebel governor or other, and says, well, follow me and let's have a coup against the emperor. The first thing the guys ask, they put their hands up and say, well, what about the pension scheme? Are you <laughs> going to guarantee, are you going to guarantee this? Um, so That's a good way to get to yeah, it. It's bread and circuses, sure. That, yeah. that matters mainly in Rome itself, but um, sure, it's bread and circuses, but it's an awful lot else. Uh, and it's all over the empire. Uh, and uh, what he also does for non-citizens who he wants to recruit into the army mm -hmm. is he offers citizenship mm -hmm. as a carrot. Mm -hmm. what, today, the equivalent would be what? A U.S. passport. Um, mm -hmm. uh, you serve in the Roman military satisfactorily for X years, get an honorable discharge. You will become a Roman citizen. And what's more, you will get, a, well, I don't know what we'd say today, a special kind of one-time pass for a female who, and you marry her, and she will have a sufficient status that the kids you produce from the marriage, they too will be Roman citizens. Mm -hmm. So as a non-citizen, you join the Roman army and you can make it work, not with much difficulty mm -hmm. that you and your descendants indefinitely are Romans, which is what you're all supposed to love to be. And, and tens, hundreds of thousands yeah. believe 
that. They wanted that. And so they bought into the empire and supported it. Yeah. I just want to just throw in one thing about this discussion. I just am always reminded about, you know, the cliche Mussolini made the trains run on time. Um, and the notion of, you know, um, how, how do they have, what is the allure is that the dictator has affected people on the daily, uh, down to the level of their daily life, the roads that they drive on, this, the, and, and that somehow this is all part of this element of all of this comes. And Napoleon had a massive road building campaign, canal, dredging canals, making harbors better. And so the people that run their commerce out of those harbors, if there weren't British ships on the other side of them, but would, would, you know, would do better. So I do think there's just an element of the material culture uh, that you're getting the the dictator really can get down into the daily life and material culture, the housing in the in the Stalinist era. It's like this is part of my, it's it's destabilizing, but it's also the only structure that we have. It's 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 affected us in a very personal way and in a, in a material way. Yep. In that sense, all politics are local. You know, mm. whatever makes my life more pleasant is what I'm going to support. I want to move on. Um, there's a question here from Maria about uh, people f that feel dishing frenzies. I think this means like uh, fears of, of whatever, of enemies or others. This makes the fertile soil for dictatorship, at least at the start, but not necessarily later on into their continuing. I, I think it, the question is, how much does fear and frenzy of the fear contribute to the rise of dictatorships and does it survive? Any thoughts? The fear of others. No. Well, uh, yeah, w w yeah. Again, I, I'll be the wet blanket if you like, or the devil's advocate, or whatever, because I think yes, that may help. In the Roman case, that may help the great ruler emerge. Mm -hmm. But one, and again, we're, we're, this is Augustus, but but he but he's the one who lasts, uh, and his regime lasts. Uh, but but the reason it lasts is that he removes fear. You have yeah. freedom from fear, if you like. And mm -hmm. one of the things that he wants to say to people is, look, the last, ooh, depending on how you calculate it, 40, 50, even 100 years in Rome and everything to do with Rome has been increasingly chaotic, uh, violent, uh, poverty deprived, poverty stricken. I am going to give you peace. I'm going to make Roman territory, I'm going to expand it, and the Roman Empire, uh, Roman society is going to be peaceful, and therefore you can prosper. Yeah. And you're not going to have things, you're not going to have these kind of worries anymore. Uh, and he delivers. He so let me, let me move on to a, another question from Paul Connick. Um, he, he's talking about the political theorist Carl Schmidt arguing that one of the appeals of anti-liberal movements, which might be a way of talking about modern authoritarians, is that people feel that modernity itself is dangerous or something to be feared, that there's a big mistake. Now, this may not apply to the Roman uh, Empire so much, but he, he wonders if this isn't, for example, part of the appeal for Trump in that there is a fear that modernity is taking away something that's valuable and that can't be replaced, and that authoritarian leaders promise to protect something that is at risk. Modernity itself is a danger. And of course, for one thing, it's, it you know, gets equated with anti-religious thoughts. Any, any ideas about that, that, that authoritarians appeal to people who fear certain developments in modernity? I'm gonna punt and push this to the 20th century, folks, because I feel like, um, you know, this concept of modernity we're hearing from Carl Schmidt is following a lot of maybe the 19th century uh, social science trends that uh, that Anna was talking about and whatnot. So I punt to the 20th century on this one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so I would, um, I guess I would also kind of qualify the term of modernity and what kind of, the crisis of what kind of modernity are we facing in the United States right now. I think that we're facing the crisis of capitalist modernity and of particular kind of capitalism uh, that is uh, moving away from welfare capitalism very rapidly. And uh, the uh, Trump administration is the carrier <laughs> of, that, of that direction. Right, so, um, 
when I was so the question about like so I wanted to connect questions of of fear and fears of modernity into one I mean, like mm -hmm. for one I would like to say well if appeals to fear work in the society at large then we are actually talking about a society that for whatever reasons uh, feels very vulnerable because in a, in a society where lives are predictable uh, they're comfortable people have a sense that their lives have meaning or they can at least narrate what their tomorrow is going to be. In societies like this, uh, discourses of fear, appeals to fear, just don't work. Uh, so like that's why we don't always have, like not every moment in history is ripe for a dictatorship. I mean, there are certain particular moments in history which are perfect for that kind of discourse. Uh, and, um, and I think that at the present moment, we are facing the crisis right now, but the crisis had started a long time ago, <laughs> right? So the crisis where, uh, we do have a significant portion of population that, that doesn't feel to be included into the script of contemporary uh, yeah. kind of kind of capitalist modernity that had been built that had been coming to the kind of, of coming of age over the last thirty years, right? Oh, twenty-five. I mean, like I don't know how to. We can start from the seventies. We can start from the eighties. Uh, but this is the period where I mean, the people who are uh, who are very vulnerable to discourses of fear and who actually want to change and for very complex reasons actually align themselves with a and basically non-democratic leader who is doesn't care about democracy but only cares about like basically our leader right now doesn't care about anything except his own like you know interest. Uh, so that's kind of an extreme case of because the dictators we have been talking about actually did have like. Did, did, they did have public consciousness. Like Stalin is a dictator who nevertheless actually built social spaces and social welfare state, and that a foundation for that social welfare state for the future. Like here, nothing is being built for society at all. Like it's just a completely wasteful four years of destruction, no construction whatsoever. Uh, and um, so, so we, so it is not surprising. Like. If, uh, so the only way to preempt this kind of scenarios in the future would be actually to 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 integrating different for uh, to basically allow people who feel uh, ousted economically, politically, and culturally back into the society, and that requires an enormous amount of restructuring uh, mm -hmm. in the society. And uh, maybe we can have like a workshop on that because it's actually fascinating to see like, kind of to to break down this idea that. Uh, if somebody has social welfare and somebody actually has a free education and free medical care, somehow that is socialism and that's the definition bad. But why, how do, why do you care how you call it? <laughs> like if it is like, like if, you, if you have a healthcare, why do you care you call it socialism, right? Uh, so, so I think that we def so I think that um, basically the Trump is creating a very simple answer to a very complex question and complex long-term complex social and political uh, kind of struggle in this country that has its very unique peculiarities mm -hmm. uh, and if we allow so and I'm all, I was also thinking that what, what strikes me as as being a parallel between Stalin's period and the contemporary moment in the United States is that we do have the moment when social fabrics are falling apart Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Like that's what makes it even worse. Like we have had a long-term political economic problem in the country that actually had been expelling certain citizens from, like at least they don't have a sense of belonging to a larger group of people or being ousted from the political and economic life. But now that first of all, uh, kind of the, the, the pandemic actually foregrounded how unjust uh, the system works in a lot of ways. But on the other hand, we also, uh, millions of people cannot carry, out, carry on their lives as they used to. So in literal sense, fabrics of social life are falling apart. People don't mm -hmm. know how they're gonna make, how they, where the paycheck is coming from. They don't know how, like, they don't know how, they cannot imagine the future. So that also makes the, the, any kind of easy promise or, fix, or fast fix a very appealing promise. So th this is one of the patterns then you might say, you mentioned earlier the breakdown of social institutions, anomie, the, the sense of disconnectedness. And this may be one of the contexts in which dictatorial or authoritarian leaders become most successful and popular because they offer some sense of connection, if not with the social community, at least with something beyond the self that, that can provide that. Miguel, do you have any, any thoughts about um, about this issue of, of um, well, well, let's say that the, the 
the problem of modernity, fear of, of modern society. Yeah, I mean, I think there is something to that for sure in in uh, 20th century uh, context and tw going into the 21st century as well. I think that uh, part of what um, uh, modernity is in is the kind of uh, globalization, which mm -hmm. has definitely kind of produced that kind of a a reaction and a sense of vulnerability, as Anna was just saying. And I feel like that's definitely something that's been observable. Uh, around the globe, uh, actually, in, in, in 21st century, even where we see these sort of more nationalist kind of uh, kind of reactions where people feel a, um, a desire to move away from this kind of fast changing world. And modernity is actually kind of moving at a pace that we can't really uh, keep up with. Uh, um, and so you, I see that kind of that reaction to where people um, would want to gravitate toward a personality who can who can actually offer this sense of, of of continuity with the past instead of just kind of jumping into the abyss of, of the future and as the the world kind of uh, shrinks i see why people would would, would really gravitate toward a simplified message as Anna was saying i think um one of the things that these dictators do really well is 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 take these complex uh, processes uh that require very uh, very kind of thoughtful and complicated uh, solutions and simplifying them and making them digestible in a way that is kind of uh, that is digestible for people. So I think that uh, I would say there's some truth to that. And I, I'm just building on what Anna said. Uh, that seems to be the moment that we're in right now. So we've actually gone over just a few minutes from what we had intended. But uh, there, there's I want to ask one more question. This came from James Evans. And then there's no final uh, conclusion to all of this, but we will wrap it up. He says, I'm surprised there hasn't been more discussion about the importance of controlling the military. Isn't this critical, especially if popular support isn't extreme? How do dictators ensure that they have the raw and robust support of the military? Is the military essential to all authoritarian regimes? Well, it was absolutely essential. And the main component of, Nap of Napoleon's regime, of course, he came out of the military. I think that's a, you know, we're talking about a military dictatorship. He, mm -hmm. And so the way you maintain that support of the military in this case is you uh, give them all sorts of support reorganization, you just redesign their entire artillery system, you fund them better than they have been funded in the directory era, you give them new, you give them eagles in the Roman idea to say that you are actually like a, you are carrying on to traditions all the way back from Rome to protect the Republic. And so in the case of a straight up military, I'm curious about the example with Pinochet, maybe it's similar. If you already control the military and that is the backbone of your regime, then you're gonna do everything you can to make sure that that military is satisfied. Uh, in the question that came to me about Napoleon at the end, like why did the military keep you know, going along with them. We talked about that mystery of being a veteran and, and, and yeah, it's tough that, yeah, you don't like that you're on these wars all the time, but it creates this uh, cadre and esprit de corps and whatnot. And so, you know, Napoleon knew how to play all of that, how to give ribbons and decorations yep. and how to, you know, to the point that he could actually, you know, muster up a new army in the spring of 1814 out of nothing and still have people marching, you know, through the snow for him. And, and so, if it's a military dictatorship, then I think the answer is simple. You keep the military well stocked uh, and, and you keep them well loved and you make sure that they're going to always be there as a backbone for you. When did Napoleon abdicate? When his marshals came to him and said, we're not gonna follow you anymore. And that was symbolic to him that he maybe had lost the military. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. As he went on to say in 1815, though, I don't need the marshals because look how much of the military came and rallied back to me anyway. I made a mistake in 1814. Well, I, I think um, maybe we should wrap it up. Let me just end with one final question that I would like each of you to answer as briefly as you possibly can. Given the situation we're living in now and what you've learned from your historical studies, what do you think makes history important for understanding our current situation? Why history can give us some perspective on what we're dealing with in 2020? Well, it's, it's as Thucydides said, uh, situations that occurred in the past will recur. Okay, thank you. Miguel, do you have any thoughts? Why should we still care about history in a moment like this? 
if we don't care about history in a moment like this, and when will we ever care about history? Uh, I think that 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 we really need historians more now than than we have in a very long time, uh, particularly in this context in this country. Uh, I hope that this seminar has really showed why that's the case, um, and I think that um, that really we we not just learn the lessons from the past, but we see patterns in the present that uh, that then allow us not to necessarily to predict what's going to happen, but to explain um, what path we are on and how we can get off of it. Thank you. I would just say, uh, you know, Max? adding to all of these various things that I'm hearing, I would just say that one of the things that we do with history is we, we do sort of look back and look for analogies and say, okay, well, that's a similar situation or that's a, and we need to appreciate difference. First of all, mm. that things aren't always the same and we need yeah. to understand that. But if we do see some analogies, it's okay for us to creatively think, what are some of the things we're taking for granted when we talk about democracy, when we talk about institutions, when we talk about voting, um, and how can we see that these things have been subverted in other ways? And so it's certainly without having those, we, should, we need to be careful because it, history doesn't actually repeat, right? You know, it is, no, well, it is you know, but, but it is something that we need to be aware of. And we need to, it's a creative process by which we should be questioning our own comfort with the institutions and things we take for granted today by looking back in the past and seeing how these terms are different even back then. And it makes sense to understand them in that context and learn from how they were subverted back then and maybe even possibly today. Anna, Anna, do you have any thoughts on why we should still care about history? Yeah, I think I will make even a stronger case. I think that given the precedence of the, of the 20th century, we actually can, um, um, well, kind of map out the worst case scenario of how we can uh, exit this particular uh, crisis. Uh, it's a constitutional crisis, clearly already taking place and there's a political crisis, it's an economic crisis, it's a medical crisis, an educational crisis, right? It's a, it's a, so we can actually map out like the worst case scenario and that actually preparing for the worst case scenario is always the best and which means that the preparation needs to take place right now and we cannot wait until uh, November. Um, and uh, from this particular seminar, I think like for me, my takeaway would be is that we, we like just to quote Miguel, is that the American ex exceptionalism doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. like, well, thank you. We vote with the rest of the world. So I, as they say, history doesn't repeat itself, but it certainly rhymes, right? I always like that expression because it's something <laughs> similar and something a little different. And we are truly in a moment of intersecting crises. And I ask that question because at Carolina Public Humanities, for us, the ultimate question is always, how do we get out of this mess without humanistic perspectives? And the answer is we don't. <laughs> so I want to thank our speakers, Richard Talbert, Max Orr, Anna Karilova, and Miguel Lacerna. You've all done a great job. And I want to thank all of you in the audience. We still have over 60 people with us. And this is a first ever Adventures and Ideas seminar that began on Monday and continues to Friday. It's like Napoleon's retreat from Russia. It goes on and on. And we thank you so much for being part of this experiment. We're all learning our way forward and you are part of that process. So we are going to continue next week. We have a good program on Wednesday about the problem of genocide and ideas about genocide with Dirk Moses from UNC. We also have coming up in the following week, Polarization in American Elections, 1800, 1860, and 1968. And I, I will just say that I'm one of the speakers and uh, Freddie Kiger and Suzanne Globetti is going to be part of it. So we look forward to seeing all of you again. And thank you to my colleagues. You're all fantastic. If we were in the same room, we would now lift a glass of wine and call it History does not repeat itself. It always moves forward. Thank you, everybody. I'm sorry we didn't cover every Thank question, you. but a good humanistic seminar always ends with a couple of questions oh. that cannot yet be answered. <laughs> Have Thank a wonderful you. weekend, everybody. Thank you very much. Thanks, Lloyd. Thank bye you, bye. Take care. Great to see all of you. Bye-bye. <laughs>